So I'm here to talk to you today about uh, washing machines and rocket ships and a little bit about data. If we get the slides up, great. Um, so uh, I am a professor at Berkeley. I have a little company called Trifact. I'll tell you a little bit about those. Um, so technology, obviously, if you're here, you're probably enamored with technology. I think we all are. It's wonderful. And it's been an amazing century, really, for technology when we think back to where things were. In 1900, the Wright brothers moved to Kitty Hawk to do their, their work, and this is the sort of first planes they were building. They were just gliders, right? And, of course, over the course of the 20th century, we got uh, jet planes and commercial airliners, and we broke the sound barrier, and by gosh, we went into outer space in rocket ships, and uh, we have things like space shuttles that flew over my building not long ago, which was pretty neat to be parked in Los Angeles. So it's all very exciting, um, and I think in data science, analogously, we all get very excited about technologies, about engines for doing things at enormous scale, and about algorithms for finding incredible things in your data. Um, but the 20th century is also a story of a sort of quieter but perhaps much more profound impact of technology, and that's in the field of productivity. And when we think of productivity, I think you should go back and think about productivity in terms of very human things like washing clothes. So traditionally, clothes were washed you know, down by the river, uh, often on stones and rocks. And then uh, you know, over the course of the late 1800s into the 20th century, machines were introduced to increase the productivity of almost entirely women who were doing this work in the home. And over the course of the 20th century, these machines were mechanized to the point where we have a very familiar technology, one that we take completely for granted, the electric washing machine. And if you think for a moment, just stop and think about your life if you had to wash your clothes by the river. It's something incredible that we take for granted, all right? And much more profound impact on our lives than rocket ships, frankly. Okay, so... Uh, Productivity, the great thing about it is that it's basic economics. So in the century, the 20th century, from 1900 to about 1980, the number of hours per week spent on housework went from almost 60 to less than 20. And correspondingly, women started entering the workplace to the point where in, 19, in 1890, there were about 10% of the workforce was women working even part-time. By only 1980, 50% of the workforce was women working part or full-time, although not with a very good earnings ratio, which is a separate talk I'm not going to have right now. Um, but the amount of people that were brought to the table to do productive work uh, just changed incredibly over the course of a uh, century due to productivity technology. And we have similar issues going on today in data science, and that's what I want to talk about. So I have two aspects of this I want to come to. First is the efficient use of scarce labor, and secondly, expanding the labor pool itself, all right? So when we think about scarce labor, you know, there's this great ad, please let your wife come into the living room, which is an ad for a dishwasher. Okay, and the idea is that who of all people in the family should be out there with the kids but mom, and mom was back washing the dishes, a terrible thing. So let's look at this in the data science context. Uh, here's a quote from DJ Patil from his uh, data jujitsu paper. He said, 80% of the work in any data project is in cleaning the data. We are washing our data at the side of the river on stones. We are really in the early, early ages of productivity technology and data science, all right? Now, DJ Patil, you know, he's a uh, data scientist in residence at Greylock, and as a member of the faculty at the University of Maryland, his research focused on nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory applied to numerical weather prediction. And he made this quote based on his experience as a data scientist and manager at LinkedIn. This guy should not be writing Python scripts cleaning up his data 80% of the time. That is a bad use of DJ Patil. And it's probably a bad use of most of the people in this room. Okay? This is a very poor use of some very scarce labor, as we've discussed. There's very few people who can do the interesting parts of this job, and we've got them spending 88% of their time doing the boring bits. Okay, so talked a little bit about efficient use of scarce labor. Let's talk about increasing the labor pool. All right, the demand for deep analytical talent in the United States, this is the McKinsey Big Data Report, could be 50 to 60% greater than its projected supply by 2018. We need to find some way to backfill the number of people we bring to the table. It's not just about making DJ Patil more efficient, it's about finding more people to do the job. We are not the first people to have dealt with a labor problem, as an ad for washing machines. A real servant in the home is a rarity in these days of complex labor conditions. 
All right? This stuff is an old problem, and it's often solved by technology, by productivity technology. So we went out and did a study, uh, some colleagues of mine at Stanford and myself, uh, of data scientists out in the field. We interviewed 35 people across about 25 companies. And we uh, heard many of the things I'm telling you today. And there's one person who had a really wonderful quote I want to share. The first half of his quote sounded very much like DJ's. I spend more than half my time integrating, cleansing, and transforming data without doing any actual analysis. Most of the time, I'm lucky if I get to do any analysis analysis at all. But this second part is the part that I think is really quite interesting from the labor perspective. Most of the time, once you transform the data, the insights can be scarily obvious. So the implication of that is that if we can solve this drudgery problem, if we can set aside the 80% of time wasted on drudgery, actually a lot of people could be doing productive things with data because the end analytics aren't in all cases complex or rocket ship-like at all. They're often rather blue-collar things like doing bar charts and breakdowns. Uh, oftentimes, once you know the data, once you get it into shape, you learn a lot about what you needed. All right. And so I feel very optimistic about this productive grand challenge, which is, let's do a moonshot. For no, that's actually not the right challenge at all, I think. The right challenge is simply, let's develop productivity technology to widen the labor bottleneck. Let's put all our big brains and all that data to work at making this a more efficient process. I think that is the grand challenge for the next few years in data science and in technology. How do we do that? Well, let me give you an example from some of the research we've done at Berkeley. And we're going to take the very unsexy task of data entry, as in data entry technician sort of data entry, typing things into a computer from paper. So we had research on a system called Shredder, uh, run by a student of mine named Kwong Chen. Kwong has since commercialized this work in his company, Captricity.com, which I encourage you to look at. A very interesting company. I'll talk to you a bit about how they did things in Shredder in the research, how we did things. Um, the idea, this is an exam I gave. It's the answer sheet to an exam I gave uh, for my database class. Uh, students fill these things in. And the way this works is you upload it to a web service. And then at that web service, you upload one of the exams. And you highlight all the places on the screen where students would be filling in things. Okay? And then you take the whole stack of exams, 300 exams. You scan them, which takes about 30 seconds on a big scanner these days. And you upload that. And the computer automatically shreds this thing into little boxes, little images, one for each blank in each exam. So question one, question two, question three, question four, and so on. Those all become separate files. And those files are then uploaded and sent to a Mechanical Turk-style crowdsourcing environment, which in fact was Mechanical Turk in this case. And what's interesting is once you've shredded it up, you don't have to type in the data in the order it appears in the form. You can type it in across forms. And so what you can do is you can have a data entry technician do something like question three for a while. And if you think about that from a human-computer interaction point of view, now they're just doing true, true or false, which is a two-button thing. And it's much quicker to do true-false over and over and over than it is to go horizontally through the forms. So we're taking ideas from column store databases and applying them to data entry. But we can go further than that using some machine learning and uh, similar things. Um, where we can take the forms and we can predict what we think the values are in the fields and then just get the data entry person to validate them. So here's a case where we clustered a whole bunch of things. We thought they all say Michael, and we asked the person to click the things that don't say Michael. And in just a few clicks, they've entered 35 values. Right? And we can also seed this with uh, wrong information, like the Philip you see up in the fourth column, to see if we're getting good data from the person who's doing the confirmation. So with a certain amount of statistical machine learning and survey methodology, you can make data entry a much more efficient task, essentially using the same kinds of compression techniques that we use for storage and query processing. All right. So I want to get back, though, to this question of DJ Patil with the increased labor pool. And how can we solve this? Because this is the work that I'm actually actively doing these days. How do we deal with this problem of cleaning data and improving analytic productivity? I believe that the way to attack this technically is to really take a threefold approach. You have to integrate three kinds of technology. I call this the analytic trifecta. I think you have to go after all three of these things together to get this right. First and foremost, the computer science has to start with the people end, by which I mean you have to look at interaction design, data visualization, and uh, human perception, and take those as the real first-order problems in the space. And then you have to meld that research with an understanding of data and data processing. That means data at scale, so query processing and all the good things that go with it. It means approximation for data sets that are too large to work with interactively. You have to deal with uh, progressive sampling and things like that. And it means high-level domain-specific languages that are appropriate to the tasks of uh, preparing Comparing data, which aren't necessarily the same languages you would use for query processing or analytics. And then finally, you have to deal with computation, doing things like inference and prediction over both the data 
and over the behaviors that people take with the interfaces to try to find out or predict what the user's intent is with respect to the data. And so the company we've started called Trifacta is based on uh, marrying technologies from all three of these spaces. And our goal is really to build radically more productive tools for data analysis. It's a very interesting company, I'll briefly tell you. The founders are myself, my colleague Jeff Hare, who's a professor at Stanford in human-computer interaction, one of the authors of D3.js, which is a widely used visualization toolkit, and our, uh, our student who we've been co-advising, Sean Kandel. We have, I believe, the best technology advisory board the world has ever seen. So on the left-hand side, some of the leading people in data science out, out in the field and visionaries in, in the space. And on the right, some of the leading academics in areas like human-computer interaction, crowdsourcing, machine learning, and databases. So it's a very exciting time working with all these folks trying to build a better washing machine for data and make your lives much less full of drudgery. So I'll be happy to talk to people afterwards about the company or about any of these issues. Thanks.